Hi, I'm Russell Leidig. This presentation is Visualizing Dysplasianism. We're going to look at some ways of developing visual and mental intuition for what dysplasianism is. Dysplasianism is a very powerful statistical analysis tool that can save you a lot of time, money, and energy on certain forms of signal analysis. But if you don't have a good intuition for what it's actually measuring, it's completely useless. So all of the mathematics behind it and all the utilities that you're going to see used in this presentation are available for free on my blog, dysplasianism.blogspot.com. Let's get started. So dysplasianism is useful for analyzing a wide variety of different signals, but one of the uh, most poignant applications, I think, is the search for deeply buried signals. So here we have uh, a targa file, signal.tga. Targa, if you're not familiar, is just an uncompressed uh, image format, so you have raw, red, green, blue pixels. So every pixel has a red, green, and blue byte, so it's three bytes per pixel. And in this case, red, green, and blue are all the same because this is a grayscale image, and it uh, goes from black to white and everything in between. Um, as you can see, it's very, very random. Um, in fact, this data was generated by my NRANDA true random number generator, so it's physically true random noise. There's absolutely nothing to this of interest, except for one thing. There is a signal, a tiny signal, that is buried in this 1000 by 1000 pixel image. And I know that because I buried it in there. So if we zoom up to like 800%, way down here, if you see my pointer at the bottom, this last scan line, you can see this, this very short pulse of a square wave, right? It goes white, black, white, black, white, black, 11 times. So. So basically, there's you know 22 pixels in this, which is essentially two orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the entire data set that we're analyzing. Um, and again, here you can see the dimensions. It's 1,000 by 1,000. And the question is, is there any way that dysplasianism uh, a could actually even find this signal, and B, you know, how how difficult, how how time consuming would it be? Well, let's have a look. So um, let's go into Displosimeter folder. All right, so you can download Displosimeter off my blog. So I'm going to make something called signal sort, and I'm going to do it at quad precision. Uh, let me zoom this; so you can see it. So quad precision is a very high uh, numerical precision. And what signal sort does is it sorts data sets um, that are broken into frames. And in this case, a frame is a thousand pixel scan line. And it sorts them by their dysplasianism. Um, and again, dysplasianism is, is a measure of information density. So the higher the dysplasianism, the lower the information density. If you want to think of it this way, the, the better compression you would get if you compressed it through a uh, you know an archive compression utility, for instance. So temp signal sort. I'm going to run signal sort. I've got in my temp folder, I've got this uh, signal.target file. The header is 18 bytes. That's not part of the pixel data. And I'm going to put a zero here, which means please ignore the header. I'm not interested in analyzing that. I'm going to put a zero here, which means each sample is one, one byte. Well, it's not. It's actually three bytes, but it's much faster to do one byte analysis, and the results are very similar. So we'll do it that way. Um, there are 3,000 pixels. Uh, 3,000 3, bytes, excuse me, per scan line or per data frame, if you want to think of that. And that's a horizontal scan line, okay? So again, there's 1,000 pixels. Each pixel has three bytes, so it's 3,000 bytes. But we're going to encode it as maximum index, so it's 2,999, all right? And I'm going to pipe at the head, which just gives the first few lines of the output. All right, so virtually in real time, it's gone through the whole million pixel image. It's done its dysplasianism analysis. What is this junk? Well, this is scan line number, okay? And over here, this is dysplasianism uh, represented as a fraction. R remember, dysplasianism runs from 0 to 1. So the closer to 1, the higher the information density and vice versa. So 0 is basically 0. And notice these are hexadecimal, as are these, right? So 0 is just 0 hexadecimal, and 1 is 8, 0, 0, 0, 0 hexadecimal. OK, so these numbers are all very close to zero, which means that the information density is very, very high. They're not very compressible, which is not surprising because it's random junk. Okay, But what's interesting is, is that 1EB, which, oh, by the way, happens to be 491 in decimal, has actually the highest compressibility by, by a hair, mind you. It's not much uh, greater than the second one, but, it, but it, it's definitely the most likely place, if there is any place in this entire data set to find an intelligent signal, uh, th this would be the most likely place. So 
What does this tell us? <clears throat> well, in and of itself, not much. It says nothing about what the signal looks like. Um, but it does tell us that if we're going to use our resources wisely, that we'd probably better spend more time analyzing scan line number 491 than some other scan line that's not even on here at all. And indeed, depending on the frame size, uh, let's just say 100 pixels per frame, sometimes you can see the difference much, much more starkly. So here are the second, third, fourth, and so on have dysplosionisms beginning with like 2928. But look at the first one. The, the, the highest dysplosionism begins with 404. So, so there's a radical difference, which in this case, uh, it would tell us not only is it worth spending more time on this particular first frame, but, but there's really actually a good chance that there's something in here. It's not just statistical luck that it came to the top of the pile. Um, but we really didn't need to do this because if we were willing to spend any time at all analyzing this data set, uh, we would have we would have analyzed the um, the top of the list um, scan line more rigorously than any other scan line um, to begin with, just based off of the first result. Uh, oh, and by the way, the uh, frame number has changed here because the frame size has changed. Okay, um, but this signal is highly contrived. Um, I wonder if it would work for a quote-unquote real-world signal. So back back to this image here. So here you see this this signal again. Well, it's highly contrived in two ways. The first way, obviously, is uh, the white is pure white. It's 255. The black is pure black. It's zero, and we never get something that noise-free. Um, the closest approximation in nature might be, for instance, uh, a laser pulse that was detected, you know, by the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or something because aliens are trying to communicate. So we get this very short pulse of data, but it's very, very bright and very, very clear. It has very little noise in it. Um, but what if this had noise in it? Well, just like with any other statistical analysis method, the more noise you inject into a signal, um, you, you have to do one of two things um, in, in order to, for that signal to become evident. Either you have to uh, increase the amplitude, and we're already at maximum amplitude, or, or you have to increase the duration. So if it was a very low amplitude noisy signal superimposed on noise, we would need a lot more samples in order to realize that there was something intelligent going on there. Nevertheless, we found this signal. Now, uh, you could argue, well, well, this isn't very exciting, right? Because you could have used Fourier analysis or wavelet analysis or wave atom analysis or heart wavelet analysis or any of the other billion forms of you know, wave transforms to actually find the signal. And I'm sure they would work uh, to varying extents. Um, but <clears throat> there's a couple problems with that. Uh, the first problem is that, as I explained in my previous video, um, the complexity of doing that is ostensibly n log n, where n is, in this case, a million pixels, a thousand by a thousand. Okay, but it's much worse than that in reality because the memory access pattern due to performing those transforms is highly irregular and it's very unpredictable for the most part to your computer. And so you get a lot of cache misses, a lot of latency, or if you're doing the whole thing on a large enough data set over a network, you get packet losses and all this stuff, and it just takes a really freaking long time. Whereas the dysplosionism approach basically uh, is ON. In other words, you only look at every single pixel exactly one time. You don't care about comparing it to its neighbors in, in any way whatsoever. And you can literally do a one after the other, single inline, serialized, whatever you want to call it, pass through the data one time, and you can get the dysplosionism of every single scan line. So this is a very predictable, it is the most predictable data access pattern you can have. So it's very, very fast. And then at the end of the day, um, you basically have the dysplosionism of every scan line. And, you know, it takes a little bit of time to sort those dysplosionisms. But the reality is you probably don't even have to do that because in most cases with heavily buried signals, um, the vast majority, say 99% or more of the data, is completely uninteresting and uninformative. So you would only keep a cache of like the top 1% or less um, most interesting data frames. So you wouldn't even have to perform a sort on the dysplosionism. So at the end of the day, for all practical purposes, this is an ON single pass real-time algorithm to find deeply buried intelligent signals. Hello, data analysis people. Okay, there is something even cooler though. Because so the first thing I told this is contrived because you know it's 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 a very clean signal all right and I explained what would happen if we noise it up a little bit and by the way we might have to look at like the first derivative in order to to better detect a smoothly varying uh, signal like this this is effectively sort of a carrier signal even though it's a square wave all right but 
The other way it's contrived is it's highly localized, all right? And there's this implicit belief in the minds of those who, who make up Fourier transforms and wavelet transforms and so forth that nature usually does most of its intelligent, interesting stuff in a very localized way. And I'd have to agree with them, right? I mean, the universe is not this dispersed cloud of randomness, right? There, there are concentrated phenomena that are concentrated in space and time. So it makes a lot of sense to, do, uh, to develop analysis techniques and use analysis techniques that presume that the signal you're looking for is spatially or temporally localized. However, there are certain data sets in which this is not the case. They may be spread out over time at periodic intervals, or worse, they might simply constitute a diffuse statistical skew to the data that is not periodic in nature. L let me explain what I mean by that. Let's imagine, take, take this last scan line where I put this contrived signal. Let's imagine that I randomly mixed up the order of all these pixels. I didn't, I didn't move them into different scan lines. I kept them in the you know, scan line 491, but I randomly mixed them all up, okay? Well, Fourier analysis probably isn't going to find that anymore because I've destroyed the periodicity. And for that matter, pretty much no other analysis is going to find it very easily either. However, dysplosidism doesn't care about neighbor relationships. It would have, signal sort would have exactly the same result because it depends only upon the populations of the various pixel amplitudes in, in any given frame, the sample amplitudes, okay? So you could have an intelligent signal that is not periodic, not localized, and dysplosimeter would still be just as sensitive as though it were a localized periodic signal. So let's look at another example. Okay, so first of all, I do want to clarify one thing. Earlier I misspoke. Um, to be very clear, high dysplosionism means high compressibility and low information density. So we can, we can achieve a lot of compression on a data set that is very predictable and therefore has high dysplosionism. Low dysplosionism means there's high information density and it's not really compressible. All right, so here we have a beautiful uh, garden, outdoor garden uh, next to next to a, a Chinese architected uh, building. Uh, so there's this beautiful outdoor pavilion is kind of a smooth marble or alabaster, and then we have these these lily paths and the and the water kind of reflecting the trees. In the background, we have a whole lot of vegetation. Well, this is an example of a signal that has a very wide diversity of dysplosionism. It's not like there's a needle buried in a haystack where everything else is total noise. So we have, uh, on the bottom of the image, we have some rather uh, high dysplosionism, very predictable data, where we have these beautiful smooth shades of green slowly varying uh, in the lily pads. And toward the middle of the picture, we have sort of the same thing with this smoothly varying tone in the in the in the white marble wall of the of the gazebo or whatever this this pavilion is. And and then toward the top of the picture, we have what seems much more chaotic. There's there's uh, wide variances in brightness um, among the different pixels corresponding to the vegetation and the rocks and some. Uh, artificial walkway structures back here. So, so there's there's a kind of a wide variety of dysplosionism. Well, can we use signal sort to sort of intuitively um, sort this on a scan line by scan line basis um, by entropy level? And if we did that, how would it compare to our intuitive sense um, of of dysplosionism uh, of uh, entropy and, and information density? So, let's try to do that. Um, let's run signal sort on this uh, sample image here, okay, and it's the same 18 byte header. At this time, we're going to pay attention to the header because we're actually going to copy it. Um, I'll show you how this works. Um, and then let's just do a, you know, zero bytes per, um, um, I'm, I'm sorry, one, one byte per sample. And I happen to know that it's 5,312 pixels per scan line times three bytes per pixel, minus one, of course, because maximum index. So we'll paste that here. So that's the maximum byte index. And um, we're actually going to specify an output file. Um, let's just call it sorted.targa, okay? And let that run. And um, <clears throat> so then, I told you, this thing is almost real time. That's, that's a big image. It's like, I don't know, 16 megapixels or something. So what, what does that actually look like? 
this is very interesting. So this is zoomed way up. Let's, let's scale back on this. So, so this basically, again, this is exactly the same, okay, as this image, all right? But it's sorted by horizontal scan lines such that the scan lines at the top have lower, uh, um, I'm sorry, higher dysplosionism. They're more compressible, less information density. And the ones on the bottom have higher information density. So you can sort of see on an intuitive level that, yeah, if you look toward the top of the image, the shades are a lot smoother. There's a lot more repetition in terms of pixel amplitudes. Remember, we're not actually looking at smoothness here because that's a derivative concept. We're not taking derivatives. We're just looking at the number of pixels that are essentially the same. How many, how many sets of pixels are the same? It's not that simple, but if you look at the math, it's approximately like that, right? So we have these very self-similar scan lines here with a lot of the same kinds of tones. And at the bottom, we have these very chaotic scan lines with all different colors in them. But it doesn't look quite right, right? Because down here at the bottom, we have uh, you know a lot of repetition of what looks to be the very same color, and up here at the top, we have some some chaotic looking vegetation. So so this is this is interesting and it's somewhat compelling, but it's not really convincing. Well, I tell you what, let's look at the first derivative, okay? So let's actually make this other utility called delta phi. All right, delta phi takes deltas between neighbors, essentially. So if you run delta phi, it'll tell you the syntax and it'll explain all this junk. But basically, here's what we're going to do. We're going to run delta phi um, on the original sample.targa. The header size is 18. We want to copy it to a new file that's uh, been delta phi. Why do we want to copy the header? because we're not going to change the x and y dimensions and we still want the image application to be able to load it properly. All right, so the one means pay attention to the header. Um, mass granularity, we're just going to say, um, oh, I'm sorry, in this case it has to be two, meaning three bytes per sample because we're going to difference every three bytes. Um, the frame granularity, uh, this is in number of uh, masks, not number of bytes. So this is actually uh, 5311 corresponding to 5312 pixels per scan line. The output file name is temp slash, uh, let's call it sample d1 for first derivative dot targa. Um, the mode basically um, is uh, we're going to differentiate once. We're going to take the first derivative so it's a zero. And one means um, we're going to do it in separate byte lanes. So the three bytes are actually three different components, red, green, and blue. They're not a unified integer. Bam. OK, there that goes. Um, so let's, let's have a look at this. So oops, we'll open. So that's the original sorted one. Let's, let's look at the derivative. OK, so here we go. We can see that we've indeed taken the first derivative. If you look closely. Yeah, I need to zoom this a little bit more. You can see here's the, here's the wall of the pavilion, right? Here's here's some of the lily pads and the vegetation in back. This is the first derivative. And why does it have this weird staticky look to it? Well, whenever there's a negative transition, we get a negative 8-bit number like FFFE, which corresponds to very high uh, amplitude bright points. Wherever there's a positive transition, we tend to get you know 0, 1, 2, 3, which is, which is very black. So we get a lot of white, a lot of black, and not a whole heck of a lot in between. You can see some chromatic dispersion here because the different colors uh, in each pixel uh, difference somewhat, somewhat differently. But um, we're not going to sort this because it wouldn't tell us uh, an awful lot. Um, so, so let's, well, I, I, I'm sorry, we're not going to uh, learn much from this if we were just to sort it and display the sorted result. But let's do the following. Let's go ahead and run signal sort, okay? But then we're going to undifference it. We're going to integrate it back. So we're going to do exactly the same thing here. So sorted, let's say sorted D1, okay? So we're, we're running exactly the same signal sort. And in fact, if you want to see this, which is going to look very crazy, we've now sorted the first derivative by the dysplosionism. And this is probably completely unintelligible, especially uh, when I pass it through the uh, YouTube video filters. This looks like random noise. Uh, but fear not, because we're going to now integrate this. So we're going to look at sorted D1. Okay, so we've scan line sorted by dysplosionism. 
Um, and we're going to do exactly the same thing as we did before, but we're going to call it sample i1, which is integrated, so the first integral of the first derivative. In other words, we're back to the original function, basically. And this is not differentiation, it's now integration. That means integrate one time um, in separate byte lanes. Okay, so now, now what does it look like when we load sample i1? Ah, this looks more convincing, right? Because now we've got these nice, smooth tones on top, and increasingly, almost with, with perfect linearity, as we go to the bottom, we get these increasingly chaotic scan lines that are just full of vegetative mush, right? So if you compare this with, let's get rid of that, and get rid of that, I just compare it with the previous one, right? This is where we just sorted the pixels. So this is just looking at the entropy, uh, the entropy density, the information density of the pixel values literally as they are. And so we're sorting from, uh, you know, most dysplosionism, uh, most compressibility, least information density, to smallest dysplosionism on the bottom, uh, least compressibility, highest information density, and, and it's only very roughly convincing. But again, if we take the first derivative, and then we sort by the dysplosionism of the first derivative, and then we reintegrate in order to resurrect the original scan lines, we get this much, much more convincing pattern. Um, and this isn't surprising because basically the compressibility of the first derivative, as anybody who's looked at you know lossless image compression realizes, uh, the compressibility is significantly better than if you just try to compress the pixel amplitudes as they are. Um, but I hope this has given you uh, a sort of intuition about what dysplosionism is and how it might be useful. And by the way, we're not always looking for high dysplosionism like these kinds of signals. I mean, certainly if you're if you're looking for a buried intelligent signal, you'd, you'd want to do that. But there are applications where you might be looking in the middle. For example, if you wanted to learn about photographic phenomena, you know, the first few scan lines here are so smooth, they're not going to teach you much about what happens when you hit edges and this, these kinds of interesting things that happen uh, when uh, surfaces project and interact in, in an image. But toward the middle, we get more complex behavior, and you can see that, you know, the edge of the wall here and so forth, and, 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 and there's maybe more to learn depending on what you're looking for. Um, so you might actually be looking in the middle, and sometimes if you're looking for randomness in what is otherwise a very boring static signal, then you're actually going to be looking for the lowest dysplosionism. But no matter what, it's all uh, very, very fast and for all practical purposes, real time. So um, if you have any questions or comments, um, just feel free to put them in the YouTube description.